This is going to be the first video in Chapter 9 in our BC Calculus class, and the first quiz covers 9.1, 9.2, and 9.3. So this video is just going to be about 9.1, which was sequences. And I mentioned in class, sequences are not an actual part of the AP test as far as you won't see specific questions just devoted to sequences, but being able to understand a sequence really goes a long way with series. And when you take this first quiz over 9.1 to 9.3, you will have a section that asks about sequences, uh, both a couple multiple choice questions and then also a section in the short answer. So hopefully this video will help. When you're working with sequences, there are three things that you should be able to do. You should be able to come up with terms of a sequence if you're given a formula. You should be going to go the opposite way where if you're given terms, you should be able to come up with the formula. And then you should be able to look at the limit of the sequence to determine if it converges or diverges and what it converges uh, to. So the first one, very quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, just the idea if you want to find terms of a sequence, we say this is written explicitly, meaning all I do to find my terms is plug the term number in that I want. So when I plug 1 in, uh, when I plug in the 1 in the top, I'm going to get a negative, so I have a negative 1. When I plug 1 in the bottom, I'm going to have 2 plus 3, which is 5, so that is my first term. My second term, when I plug 2 in, is going to make the top positive this time, and then when I put 2 in the bottom, 2 times 2 is 4 plus 3 is 7. And then when I put 3 in, I'm going to go back to a negative. And when I put 3 in, 2 times 3 is 6, plus 3 is 9. And then my fourth term is going to be back to positive, and the bottom is going to be 11. We refer to this as an alternating sequence because the signs alternate. Uh, that is important to see how that is written because we're going to do some problems here we're going to write. Um, the other thing that is important, understanding the difference between the sequence and then a series, which we covered in the next couple sections. Series are summations. In a sequence will just list terms, whereas a series will add them together. The next part, this is probably the part that maybe gives students the most trouble, which is being able to take a pattern, identify what the pattern is, and then put it and actually symbolically write the formula for the sequence. So what I notice on the first one that I'm looking at here is that I'm going up by 4 every time. When you have that repeated addition, going up by that every time, that is going to be the coefficient of your n. Think of it almost like slope. It's going up by 4 every time, so we're going to have 4n. Um, sometimes this is referred to as an algebraic type sequence. But then you have to realize that my first term isn't 4. So to figure out how do I get my first term, I say, well, it's actually 1 less than 4, so it's going to be 4n minus 1. And the nice thing is you can always check and see if it makes sense. If I put a 2 in, do I really get 7? If I put a 3 in, do I really get 11? So that's what you're doing with a lot of these algebraic sequences. You're looking to see what are we adding each time. That becomes the coefficient of n. And then what adjustment do I need to make in order to get that first term to be whatever it is that appears? The next one, we have a, um, I'm going to go to the right here, we have an alternating sequence this time. We also have a fraction. When you're looking at a sequence that's represented by a fraction, it really helps to just think of it as two separate sequences. You've got the sequence on the top, and then you've got the sequence on the bottom. So I'm going to start with the top. Uh, what I notice on the top is that I am adding 3 every time, so I know in my numerator it's going to be a 3n. But I am starting at 5. So if, since I'm starting at 5, if I put a 1 in front, I get 3. I need to add 2 more on top of that to get my first term to start at 5. So that, and then you can do a check. Do I get 5 when I put a 1 in, then 8, then 11, then 14? On the bottom, now I'm adding 4 each time. I'm doing plus 4, plus 4, plus 4. But I need to start at an 8, so I need to add 4 onto that. The last thing that you have to deal with in this one that you don't always have to deal with is this is an alternating sequence. This sequence starts ne positive, goes negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So what that means is somewhere either in front or on top or behind, you need to put the negative 1 with the correct power. Since I want to start positive, I need an n plus 1 power so that when I put a 1 in, I'm actually squaring it. When I put a 2 in, I'm cubing it, so I'm going to negative. If you want to put that in the top and then say, well, this, this is also in its own parentheses, that's fine. A lot of times you'll just see it written out front. One thing that I want to mention about this week's sequence, and it's going to happen in some of the other ones you look at as well, notice that the way I wrote it, I did not reduce it. There will be times where you'll see a sequence like this, but they give you the reduced form. So you'll see 5 eighths, but the next term you'll see is negative two-thirds, and then you'll see the 11 sixteenths, and then the next term you'll see is actually negative seven-tenths. 
you want to look, if you're really having trouble identifying the pa pattern and its fractions, stop for a second and say, wait a second, maybe this wasn't what it looked like before they reduced. Maybe the pattern's being developed here, but they reduced the fraction, put it in lowest terms. That is something that I think having this discussion now will make your life so much easier when you take the quiz because that's the trick that they can do with the fraction ones. They can reduce it, and then you're left kind of going, oh, wait a second, it's, I don't see a pattern right away. For the next one, on the top, instead of having a constant addition, you're actually multiplying here. This is a times 2, times 2, times 2. The way that we write that is 2 to the n power. This should remind you a lot of the geometric series that we talked about in the next section, the idea that we have that constant multiplier. On the bottom, we are adding by 2 each time, so it's 2n, but we want to start at 3, so we have 2n plus 1. So here's an example of one where the top is more of that geometric, that multiplier, and the bottom is more algebraic when you're adding. There is no alternating, so I have nothing else to do on this one. The next one, one that does show up, uh, we did this one almost identical in class. I don't think we wrote it in fraction form. On the bottom, on the top it's always 1, so there's really nothing to write on the top other than it's a 1. Nothing's changing there. On the bottom, you have times 2, times 3, times 4, times 5. That increase in multiplication was the factorial that we worked with. So this would be 1 over n factorial. Factorials, having a constant addition, having a constant multiplication, having a factorial of things that you should be able to recognize. I did a couple more just because I wanted you to see a little bit more, get a little more practice. This next one may be the toughest one, because when you look at it, the first thing you might say is, well, am I doing a constant addition? I'm doing plus 3, plus 5, plus 7. No, I'm not doing a constant addition. I'm changing what I'm adding. I'm also not doing a multiplication to get there. It's not a factorial. So this is kind of your checklist you're going through. Is it a repeated addition? Is it a repeated multiplication? Is it a factorial? No, no, no. The only thing left to start checking is to look at your perfect squares. And that's really should be your last resort because you don't see a ton like that. That's actually what's happening here. And you may still look at it and go, I don't get it. I don't see a perfect squares. What you have up here is you have your perfect squares minus 1. So if you think of your perfect squares as being 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, these are 1 less than our perfect squares. Definitely a tougher one to see. I've tried with the 6 I'm doing here to give you every possible option that could show up on a test. And really when you're looking at that constant addition, the constant multiplication, the factorial, and then here's an example of squares. I will never put anything on that's working with cubics or things that maybe are not as easily recognizable. The next one's going back to a more basic one. We are doing a constant addition here. We're adding 5, adding 5, adding 5, adding 5. So we know our formula is going to have 5n. But I'm starting at 2, not at 5, so I need to subtract 3 off. And that is your formula. So going back to more of an algebraic like the first one. So the first and, th and last ones were the most basic. And then the middle one's trying to show you all the things that could show up. You should know how to make a sequence alternate. You should know how to look for repeated addition and repeated multiplication, factorials, and squares. Those are really the big things. The last thing that we did with the sequence is we determined uh, what the limit is. What is the sum, um, what would the se sequence converge to? Or does it just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and diverge? Now, with series, we have tons and tons of tests. We've so far learned five tests. We're going to learn probably five to ten more. Ser sequences are much more simplistic. The only thing we do for a sequence is take its limit. If the limit is a number, we say that it converges to that number, meaning that over time it's getting closer to it. If the limit is infinity, then we say it diverges, meaning those terms will become larger and larger. So when I look at this one, I take the limit. This is just the limit guidelines. I get 2 thirds. So we would say that my sequence converges to 2 thirds, meaning after, over time, the, the terms become closer and closer to 2 thirds. For the next one, in the bottom, I'm going to get values that are bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to go to infinity. The top is going to alternate. So you're going to have a negative and then a positive. Actually, this one starts out positive and then a negative and then positive and then a negative. But because the bottom gets zero, closer and closer to infinity, it's going to, the whole thing is going to get closer and closer to zero. So we actually say that this alternating sequence does converge. Even though it's alternating, it, as it alternates, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you're going to have a small negative number and then a small positive number and then a small negative number getting closer and closer to, to zero. The next one, if I look at what happens, when I put infinity there, this is just going to get larger and larger and larger. These terms are going to keep going up by three every time. This will go to infinity. We say that this is a diverging sequence. And then my trig one, 
when I'm working with trig, most trig functions oscillate, and that is what's going to happen here, but you want to kind of check. If I put 1 in, I get the sine of pi over 2, and that's 1. If I put 2 in, I get the sine of pi, that is 0. If I put 3 in, I get the sine of 3 pi over 2, that's negative 1. So this sequence will actually go 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0. It will never become closer. It will always oscillate or alternate between negative 1, 1 with a 0 in the middle. We say that this is a diverging sequence because it doesn't close in on that one particular number. These are the things you have to be able to do with sequence. The rest of your quiz and the rest of when you're looking at chapter tests will all deal with series, which have their own se set of many, many tests. But for sequences, if you can write the terms, if you can write the formula given terms, and determine if it converges or diverges by simply taking the limit, you can do everything that will ever be asked.